मेरे दर्द की दवा तू शान जल जलाल हो मेरे दर्द की दवा है तो तेरी शान जल लाल हो मेरे दे दिल की दवा है तो तेरी शान जल जला मेरे दर्द दिल की दवा है तो शान जल लाल हो तुझे झूठता हूँ मैं दसो तुझे झूठा मैं चार सो तेरी शान मेरे दर्द दिल की दवा है तो हो आप लोगों से तुम्हारा सके मेरे साथ मिल मिल कर कहें दर्द दिल क्या है तो तेरी शान जल जल हो मेरे दर्द की दवा है तो तेरी शान जला लो मेरे दर्द की दवा है तो तेरी शान जल लाल हो मेरे दे दिल की दवा है तो तेरी शान जल लाल तेरा नगमा बुलबुल खुश नवाना ले जा जा तेरा नगमा बुलबुल खुश नवा तेरा नाम ले नगमा बुल बुल खुश नवा तेरा ले जा तू ही भूल है तू ही रंग तू ही भूल है रंग मिलते हैं तेरी शान जला तेरी शान जल जला मिल मिल के कहे तेरी शे जल जला लो हो तेरी शान जला लो तेरी शान जल जला लो हो दर दे दिल की आह तो तेरी शान जल जला हो तू झूठ तू मैं चार सो तुझे झूठ तब मैं चार सो शान जल जला लो हो मेरे दे दिल की दाम तू तेरी शान जल जला लो ये जमीन और ये आस ये जमीन और ये आस माँ तेरा जिक्र करते गुआ और ये आस माँ ये जमीन और ये आस मेरा जिक्र करते हैं बेगुमा कहो बेशक तेरे पाके है बहू तेरी सात पाके है बाहर तेरी शान जला लो हो मेरे दर्द दिल पा है तू तेरन जल जला लो हो मेरे दर्द दिल की दवा तेरी शान जल जला लो हो दर्द दिल पा है तू तेरी शान जल जलो हो नसनम निशान है न सनम का दा निशान है नम का दाम निशान है न हम तेरा मग है न सनम का दाम निशान न हरम में ते मकान है तू है ला मग तू बगू तू है मग तू है तू बगू तेरी शाल जला दे दिल की दवा है तो शान जल लाल हो मेरे दर दे दिल की दवा है तो तेरी शान जल जला लो हो तुझे ढूंढ तू मैं चार सो ढूंढता तू मैं चार सो से जल जलो हो मेरे दर दे दिल की दवा वो तेरी शान जला लो हो और आखिर शेर में सलाम मौलाना कासिम नान तो रहमत अपने शेर में अल्लाह ताला से क्या
السلام علیکم وی آر اسٹارڈنگ السلام السلام علیکم ویسٹنگ ای کامرس اینڈ انسپیکٹر سادت نسار اف یو ریکال وی ور ڈسکسنگ فائیو والز ان اور پی وی سیکٹر دیٹ ٹولڈ یو فائیو والز ار کمبینیشن اف ہارڈویئر اینڈ سافٹویئر دی فائیو والز دے سیٹ بٹوین دی نیٹ ورک اف ان ارگنائزیشن اینڈ دی انٹرنیٹ اینڈ دین دے پروٹیکٹ دی انٹرنل نیٹ ورک اف دی ارگنائزیشن فرام آؤٹ سائیڈ اٹیکس سو دیر ار ڈفرنٹ ٹائپس اف فائیو والز آئی ٹولڈ یو دیٹ دیر ار مینلی تھری ٹائپس ون از پیکٹ فائیو والز دین از دی سیکٹ لیول فائیو والز اینڈ دین دی تھرڈ ٹائپ از دی اپلیکیشن گیٹ وے فائیو والز دی فائیو والز بیسیکلی دے کین ایگزامن دی ڈیٹا پیکٹس وچ اینٹر اور وچ لیو دا نیٹ ورک اف دی ارگنائزیشن اینڈ بیس اپان سرٹن رولز دے کین فلٹر دی ڈیٹا پیکٹس اینڈ ان دس فیشن دے پروٹیکٹ دی نیٹ ورک سو آئی شوڈ یو ا سلائڈ یو کین سی آن دی اسکرین There is a firewall which sits between the internet and the internal network of an organization and it can examine the data packets and based upon certain rules then it can decide whether these data packets they are to pass through the firewall and enter the organization network or not. Let's have an overview of each type of firewall relatively in more detail. The first type, the packet filter firewall, which is the simplest type of firewall, it operates at the data link and network layers of the OSI model. Its basic job is that it determines as to whether the incoming or outgoing packets they should be allowed to pass through the firewall or not. Normally, the IP addressing is taken as a rule to decide as to whether the data packet should pass through the firewall or not. So, in case we want certain data packets which are being sent from some device, we don't want those packets from that particular device and that particular IP address to enter into our network. By specifying that IP address, we can restrict, we can stop the entry of such data packets to pass through the firewall and to enter into our organization's network. Then, the second type, the circuit level firewalls, they primarily do the same job as the packet filter firewalls do, but they operate at the transport layer, which brings a greater functionality to these firewalls. Remember one basic rule that the higher is the layer of the OSI model, where a firewall operates, the more sophisticated is that firewall. So since the circuit level firewall operates at the transport layer, which is higher in the OSI model comparatively, therefore it brings a greater functionality to this particular type of firewall. There are two jobs that this firewall can uh, do, basically. One is that uh, it can look at the IP address of the packets which are being transmitted from an organization's network, and then it replaces the IP addresses on such packets which are leaving a network with its own IP address. In other words, the IP address on the data packets would be that of the circuit level firewall, and it would appear to a device outside the firewall that as if these packets they are originating from this particular machine, this firewall. In this fashion, the information about the host machines on that organizational network, that information, that IP address would remain secret. Then, another job that circuit level firewalls can do is that uh, they can find out that whether a particular connection it has been hijacked by a hacker and this connection is not a proper, this is not a proper connection. If that is the case, they determine that this is not the proper connection. In that eventuality, a circuit level firewall would immediately cut off the connection and would not allow the hacker to pass through to, to sneak past the firewall. Then the third type, the application gateway firewalls. Such firewalls operate at the application layer, so it means that they have the greatest the maximum functionality. The application gateway firewalls, they authenticate the user by identifying that particular user who has attempted to create uh, an HTTP or an FTP connection. So, 
Basically, such firewalls they filter out the HTTP or FTP requests, those requests which are transmitted to the application layer header. So, in contrast to the packet filter firewalls, where the data packets themselves they are filtered out by the firewall. In this application gateway firewalls, the actual HTTP or FTP requests they are filtered out by the application gateway firewall. So, whenever we want to block any outgoing FTP requests, then we can use this particular type of firewall, the application gateway firewalls. Similarly, where we want the employees of an organization, of an organization not to access certain websites, we want to restrict their access to certain websites on the internet. Then we can use application gateway firewall for that purpose. We can block their FTP, their FTP requests for that matter. Then Similarly, where we are afraid that there might be certain dangerous programs which can be downloaded by the host machines on the company's network from certain websites. Again, to stop that, we can again make use of this particular type of firewall. And as a result, those dangerous programs, they would not be downloaded, they would not disturb the network. Then there is another type, the hybrid type of firewall, which is basically a combination of the other types of firewalls. So we can combine a separate level firewall with the application gateway firewall, and then we can say that we have created a hybrid type of firewall in that manner. Then there is a term called proxy server, which I would like to refer to here in our today's lecture. A proxy server is a device, again, okay, which sits between a trusted network like our own organizational network and the untrusted network that is the internet and it can do basically three jobs for us. In this slide you can see I have shown you the setup of a proxy server. Then you see that there are a few client machines, in fact four client machines and they are connected with the help of a hub and then there is a server machine again connected to the hub and here in this fashion we create a LAN and then we connect this LAN to the proxy server and that proxy server is then connected to the internet. In this way we can say that the proxy server is sitting, is residing between the LAN, our network and the internet. The three main functions that a proxy server can do for us are number one, the HTTP requests sent by the browser, they initially reach the proxy server. And then the proxy server affixes its own IP address on the request packets instead of the IP addresses of the host machines. And in this fashion, it hides the IP addresses of the host machines by placing those IP addresses with its own IP address. And then it downloads any web page which was requested. And after it downloads that web page, then it onwards supplies that web page to the host machine to the client machine which had made that HTTP request. Number two, it can also act as a fire firewall. And where it acts as a firewall, it can then filter certain uh, requests. It can filter the entry or the exit of uh, data packets. Number three, it can do caching. Now, it may be a new term for you. Caching means that the proxy server can store web pages in its memory. And whenever a subsequent, subsequent request for those web pages is made, then it can very quickly process such HTTP requests and it can then supply those web pages, retrieving those web pages from its cache memory. So we can say that because of caching, the proxy server can entertain, can satisfy our HTTP requests very quickly. It can supply those web pages very quickly to the client machines instead of going to the actual web server. Rather, what it can do is it can retrieve those web pages from its uh, hardest and then supply it to the client machines. And in this fashion, we can say that the downloading period for the client is reduced effectively. Many ISPs, they are taking advantage of this caching concept very usefully and it can earn a lot of revenue for them because they can provide a very quick, a very fast, efficient service to their customers, their clients by quickly supplying them the requested web pages. Therefore, they can earn a good reputation, they can market themselves more effectively. Then, it may not be out of place here to talk about some web server attacks. Web servers, like client machines, they are also susceptible to outside attacks. Basically, the programs which run on the web servers, they have the potential of damaging databases residing on the server sites. Plus, they can also abnormally terminate the web server software. They can change the information which is being kept uh, on the web server. So, all these possibilities, they, they do exist and they cause a threat to the security of the web server. These attacks, they come from within the server in the form of the programs, plus they can be outside attacks. The, the examples of web server attacks are like a buffer overflow type of attack and then CGI scripts script attacks. I don't think so we need to go into details here. So these are some of the web server threats, web server attacks that can be launched. There are a number of organizations which have been set up over the years to come back to fight out these security threats. So in the year 1988, there was an organization which was formed with the help of certain research agencies and collaboration with the US government. And it has worked very efficiently so far. I have a slide for you which uh, shows its name. This is termed as Computer Emergency Response Team, abbreviated as CERT. And then one year later in 1989, another organization was formed which is called Systems Administrator, Audit, Network and Security, ANS Institute. So both these organizations so far have functioned very efficiently. Their basic job is to provide a communication infrastructure to the security experts and enable them to exchange their information, to exchange their expertise, so that the job of uh, reducing the security threats to the, into the networks, that can be reduced. There are other organizational organizations also, but these two I felt more uh, prominent in this regard, so I included uh, this information here. Then, there is a concept virtual private network. I think in the previous lecture I have touched this concept very briefly, so today we can uh, discuss it in relatively more detail. A virtual private network is a tool for remote access. So before I discuss that, it's important that we first uh, you are a small branch network of an organization and your corporate head office network exists at a remote location and you want to become part of that corporate head office network, you want to avail the resources which are available on that corporate network. One option for you is in this regard that you set up a dial-up connection with the help of a telephone line, you set up a dial-up connection with a machine with a server sitting on that corporate network and in this way through the telephone line you get uh, corporate network and then you avail those resources available there. In this particular case where you use the telephone line to become a part of the bigger network, you have to configure both the server on the corporate network and the client machine which is on the smaller the branch uh, network. So to configure that, there are options available. So in case of the machine, if we are using Windows 2000 server, then there is a special facility using which we can configure the server on the corporate network and we can then specify that the username, the password, they have to be used to authenticate the Windows operating system. They provide uh, this facility, this option, they provide connection wizard using which we can configure the client machine also and we can then specify that this is the telephone number of that remote server, that remote server is termed as RAS or remote access server. The client is termed as remote access client. Help of the telephone line then, after configuring both the remote access server and the remote access client, we can then establish the connection. What happens is that once you have configured both the machine, the server machine and the client machine, then after configuration, the client can enter a correct password, then the client can press a dial button. After that, a connection 
would be created and the telephone number of the remote access server would be dialed up and the connection can be created to the remote access server. Provided the password is correct and the user has the sanction to avail the resources available on that topic network. The protocol which is used in this type of connection is point to point protocol or abbreviated as PPP. So using this point to point protocol, the host sitting on a branch network can be created and become a part of the bigger corporate network. And then the exchange of information and the exchange of data can take place between the two machines. Then the virtual private network. Access. So, where we do not want the special telephone, the dedicated telephone line to be used for remote access, we can have an alternative we can use in virtual private network. Remember, a virtual private network is defined to be a secured, a dedicated point to point connection over the internet. The basic thing that you need to know, you need to register here, is that in case of virtual private network, we make use of the internet, the internet infrastructure for connection purposes. Okay, that means that the, in this case, we call a tunnel server that would be connected with the internet. Similarly, the remote access client here, it can be called at as the tunnel client. The tunnel client would with the internet and using the internet infrastructure, the routers, etc., then both the networks, the branch network and the bigger corporate network, they would become connected with each other. The branch office would become part of the bigger network using VPN. Again, we have to configure both the tunnel server and the tunnel client to establish a virtual private network connection. So, in case of a tunnel client, there is uh, an option we go to the internet options, then there is an option connections, we utilize that option, we click there, and then we can enable the virtual private network option there. So, we take these different steps in order to configure our tunnel client and we also specify while configuring, we specify the IP address of the tunnel server. Here, we are not using the telephone. The connection we are not using as such the telephone number of the remote access to provide the IP address of the tunnel server which we want to be connected. Similarly, the tunnel server would be configured accordingly, so it should be configured such that it can receive the user name, but username, the user password, and it can then verify the identity of the user whether this user has to be given access or not. So after this configuration on both the sides is done, then with the help of a protocol called point to point tunneling protocol PTTP, which is an encryption based protocol, which means that all the information travels in the form of uh, an encrypted data. Then with the help of this PTTP, then the exchange of information between the Tunnel client and the tunnel server that can take place the um, part of the corporate network with the help of this concept. The role of a network administrator is quite important, quite relevant. An individual who can be exchanged, so these decisions can be made by the network administrator on the server side. Then, one important thing you must register here is that the virtual private network connections, or in other words, tunnels, they are very cost effective. They are, in other words, cost reducing measures for remote access. If we compare them with the option where we use the telephone lines, the special telephone lines purposes for remote access, we can say that a virtual private network is very cheap. I can give you an example. In case of virtual private network, what we have to do basically is that we make a local telephone call to the ISP. Right? So we make local call to the cost of that local call. And then with the help of the infrastructure provided by the ISP, the routers, the other hardware arranged by the ISP, then